All right, so um, today's topic, as uh, you can see, is um, what I would call, let's say, in a classical, you know, tradition style, not very promising from the title. We're, in fact, going to talk about the Black Death pandemic. But at the same time, I would like to insist on the fact that it's going to be a sort of comedy in the sense that I promise a sort of happy ending to come, all right? So do not uh, actually, um, do not feel that it's all going to be just a, a sad picture of a past experience. Um, the overall title suggests already that what we're going to talk about, the Black Death, is a faraway past experience. We're talking about the 14th century um, experience, probably the largest pandemic in human history. Um, most of you probably have heard of it, have studied it in different contexts, and maybe you have to go a little bit far back into your, you know, um, earlier studies. Uh, but uh, with that said, let's, you know, sort of say that uh, I will begin by somehow telling you a story. So it will be a narrative in words and uh, by means of images of what the so-called Black Death at the time was. Then in the second part of this meeting, I'm hoping actually to uh, try and kind of capitalize what we, our story has uh, you know, shown us and taught us in order to reflect a little bit about the present situation and uh, you know, our current uh, experience of what is going on. So when I say the largest pandemic in uh, human history, uh, what I actually mean in figures is actually that the so-called Black Death of 1348 had a death toll which ranges as from what we know from 75 to 200 millions. So we're talking really about one of the most impressive havocs that humans have ever experienced. Just to give you a point of reference, the so-called um, infamous Spanish flu of the 1920s really only achieved, let's say, the death toll that was half of uh, the one of the Black Death of the 14th century. And to give you more contemporary references, HIV um, would actually, death toll would actually be, um, have to be multiplied by five in order to reach the range of uh, the plague we're talking about. Whereas present COVID-19, you would have to multiply as of uh, June, 2021, you would have to multiply the number of casualties by 16 times. So we're really talking about an event that completely overturned the world upside down. Now, a couple of uh, um, interesting uh, things to start with. How and where did this story of the Black Death start? Well, the first time we hear it in the chronicles of the 14th century, it's about October 14, um, excuse me, 1347. And uh, that, uh, um, that starts, for example, I would like to start with a sort of historical little anecdote. The anecdote speaks of uh, a fleet of 12 ships that were coming from the Black Sea and that were docking in the Sicilian harbor of Messina. Upon the arrival of this relatively small fleet, uh, um, everyone uh, in the harbor started realizing that it carried with it uh, something terrible. Most of the sailors had died and those that were alive were covered in uh, uh, spots, uh, were covered in buboes, and they were just nearly about to die. The Sicilian authorities at the time ordered quarantine for the ships, but that was actually not sufficient. Now, the historical anecdote per se certainly is something that, you know, um, is, uh, um, has in fact happened. But what we need to understand is that it, that was just one single episode out of many. We have similar stories that are told from the home, from the port, from the harbors of Genoa in Italy, also from Naples, from Marseille in France. So the arrival of the deadly cargo of the plague with the ship was something that occurred almost all at once on, in almost all of the coast, uh, coastal lines of uh, 
the basin of the Mediterranean across and towards the end of 1347. Where was it coming from? It was coming from the east and the far eastern areas, and it had already left a quite severe path of death on China, India, Persia, Syria, Egypt, and so on. From the coastal lines of Italy in particular, and then of Europe, it reached inland. And in the turn of a few months, it sort of became, unfortunately, um, a disease that spread all across Europe. Now, from the maps I'm showing you, you can tell not only how widespread it was, but also, you know, the severity at which it actually hit certain areas of Europe more than others. The areas that are at the center of the basin of the Mediterranean were first and more targeted than other areas. Um, what do we uh, know about uh, uh, the science of the Black Death? I think that this could be an interesting also suggestion. Um, the science of the Black Death that we are aware of today is very different from the one that they knew in the 14th century. Reason being that today we have a clear idea of what the causative agent of the Black Death was. And it was actually bacteria. And the bacteria was called Yersinia pestis, but it was only isolated and known scientifically in the second part of the 1800s. So this knowledge is something that they um, didn't have available at the time. We also know today that the bacillus itself has the ability to um, survive within a host. At the time, it was rats and various kinds of rodents. And we also know that it needed a transmission vector. The vector was the fleas that were uh, carried by rats and the bite of the flea on rats would then transmit actually it onto humans. Um, we also know today that it had different clinical forms at the time. Um, if you look at the image that I chose here, here we have one of the many personification of uh, the Black Death of the plague in the form it took in that 14th century. And I think it helped us really vividly imagine how scary a phenomenon was for people who really had a minimal understanding of the science behind it. Here we have a female figure, an allegorical figure of uh, um, the plague itself with arrow in uh, her hands and you can clearly tell that everywhere she passes she leaves sort of piles of dead bodies. The arrows are actually uh, striking exactly in the spots where that people you know would uh, most easily associate with uh, the plague itself so the lungs, the neck, the armpits and the head. Um, then, the, um, what did they know then? Well, we have a series of sources that uh, tell us what people in general were aware of at the time. And the sources are very different. They're very inhomogeneous in a sense. We have plenty of literary sources describing the plague, the most famous probably being Boccaccio's Decameron. Perhaps it rings a bell with some of you. But we also have plenty of historical chronicles of the time. We have artistic sources like the ones that I will be showing you that really kind of give us precious depictions of the plague and its symptoms. And we also have medical treatises. Imagine that at the time in the second part of the 14th century, something like two, over 280 different medical treatises were written in order to try and track the etiology, etiology of the disease that was spreading. One in particular written by um, an author whose name is Guy de Chiliac was useful later on for scientists to understand things because not only he was a practitioner at the time, but because he actually was dedicated to follow his patients e even in a moment when they felt ill. And he kept a kind of very exact record of the symptoms of the time it took for someone actually to fall ill and then eventually die. So for scientists, that became one of the most sort of valuable and important records. Um, on a side note, Guy de Chiliac himself got affected by the plague and um, miraculously, I would say, survived. 
Um, we also are informed via art, but not only art, also through the other sources about the symptoms. At the time, they were trying somehow to detect and keep track and a record of the symptoms that uh, um, were typical of the plague. Well, the first symptoms were clearly the appearance of the so-called buboes. Buboes would be really sort of uh, um, swollen lymph nodes. And uh, the buboes gave a characteristic aspect, really, of swollen parts, particularly in the groins and under the armpits of the people that got affected. From this appearance of buboes in general, we would have the name bubonic plague deriving from it. A second symptom that was recorded was the appearance of black spots, an appearance of black spots that was generally connected with internal bleeding, either of the skin or of uh, the internal organs. And that could easily lead to um, tissues uh, um, becoming septicemic. So this would actually be attributed the name of septicemic plague. And finally, a development of a pneumonia. Pneumonia with uh, possible bleeding, um, coughing, and blood. Um, and this would actually originate the term bubonic plague. For all of these symptoms that could either overlap or develop separately, everyone was also affected by a sudden you know, outburst of fever, high temperature, shortness of breath, and in general weakness. So all of those symptoms were clearly recorded. In these images that I'm showing you, you can tell how fear in part at the time led many artists to um, draw and to illustrate some of what they thought were symptoms of the plague. We know now in this case um, that these disfigured monks that are asking to be blessed by a cardinal standing right next to the altar in the image were really probably affected by other diseases, possibly leprosy, that at the time was also mistaken to be the plague. Um, in this other image, you can clearly tell how there is almost an artistic attention to the depiction of the symptoms that were novel, were unprecedented, were certainly scary. What I find interesting in this illumination that comes from one sort of illuminated version of the Bible of the early 15th century, it's actually that uh, it's directly connected, the disease, it's directly connected with biblical history. And it's in fact considered to be something similar to the sixth Egyptian plague that the um, Old Testament talks about right prior somehow to the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt. And you can see that Moses is in fact depicted in the background of the scene. Um, not only the symptoms were known, but also the causes were investigated. Obviously investigated with the knowledge uh, of the time. And the knowledge could range from pseudoscientific knowledge to superstition. In fact, some of the first causes that were brought up, and it's interesting to know that they were brought up by university trained physicians, but also by surgeons. So by what we would consider today men of science, they were naturalistic causes. And by that, they generally all agreed that the plague had possibly two causes. The first causes was what they described as impure miasmas, so seeping from the ground. And an alternative explanation was coming from their study of astrology and from the cosmological alignment of planets. In particular, they were attributing it to the negative influence of the conjunction of Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter in Aquarius. For them, that was, you know, de facto a reason that could have caused, you know, this great pandemic. But there were also other explanations, some of which range in the area of religion. For most religious people, the um, plague was in fact a sort of divine punishment. One of many in the religious history of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And it must have sort of been a way through which God punished humankind for some sort of sins that they had committed. <clears throat> 
The last but not the least important cause that they suggested was a sort of um, was attributed to, I would say, escape, um, scapegoating, you know, um, judgment. According to many, it was actually caused by the well poisoning. So poisoning the water wells was something that was uh, um, attributed to the Jews that were living in large number but still isolated community in medieval Europe. And this unfortunately led to um, almost unprecedented degrees of violence targeting those supposedly marginal groups that were found guilty of uh, you know, uh, causing this catastrophic event. And today it's one of the things that might seem most astonishing to us, but you know, these were the supposed causes that were brought up at the time. Um, in the next images, you can see how this uh, um, image of death represented by a skeleton here, it's somehow always associated with leading people by the hand, whether they were religious or not, it really didn't matter. Um, in the bottom images, you have uh, a, a depiction of the so-called very radical religious group that started developing at the time, the so-called flagellants. This would be a group of people that would whip themselves and roam somehow the cities of Europe in this attempt somehow to um, do sort of to um, punishing themselves to do penance for our sins. And this goes with the idea of attributing, you know, the plague to a divine judgment. But not only the causes, but also the psychological, in a way, um, reactions of people were definitely, um, were definitely um, recorded. In terms of psychological reaction, it's interesting to know that they were very um, ambiguous. They were very disparate, 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 excuse me, even, in the sense that some people decided to live in a very strict austerity lifestyle. They were living extremely in uh, a temperate way, while at the same time, in the same village, in the same neighborhood of Barra or, or Boro, people would actually instead decide to live extravagantly, excessively, spend everything that they had because to them, you know, the end of the world was about to come. So we have very sort of polar opposite reactions from a psychological point of view. Some people, for example, decide to bond together. Other people prefer and choose a very strict isolation. Some people flew from the cities and found retreat in the countryside where it was apparent that the death toll was lower compared to overcrowded areas like you know, the cities in the 14th century, 14th century where. Uh, other decided instead to lock themselves up in the city houses and therefore remain in uh, the city throughout the entire duration of the plague. Some other were extremely compassionate. They would uh, be committed to helping other and everyone in need, while other people were completely disregarding any sort of uh, you know, human um, compassion and they were behaving in a very selfish way, looking for um, their own survival first and foremost. The images I'm showing you are, I think, interesting because they really depict, you know, this image of uh, the skeleton, so the emblematic image of death that is really kind of walking, sharing, you know, the daily life experience of people, which gives us a sense of the fear and of the overall, you know, um, idea of impending death that must have accompanied people at the time. What you see here is a beautiful portion of a fresco, which is nestled really in a city, Bergamo, nearby Milan. And uh, it's uh, actually uh, the oratory uh, of Clusone. And here you can tell how um, you know, this image of death becomes almost one and the same with the rhetoric of the religious stories told at the time.
Here we have a quote from Boccaccio, the Decameron, one of the most probably important literary sources that um, allows us, you know, to look into the plague. And as you can tell, you know, from the quotes that I chose, he actually gives us a, sort of an example and a record of how many people were living, as I said, you know, in excesses, how they were looting other people's property, how they were drinking and spending everything they had and he describes that as a bestial behavior so interesting to know that there was uh, to an extent also kind of a moral evaluation of certain behaviors at the time what we also were um are now aware of through the chronicles of the time is the social consequences. Social consequences of the Black Death were um, enormous. They were unprecedented. We have what is described as the constant dissolution of familial ties, of relational ties. ties. Boccaccio himself describes mothers and fathers abandoning you know, their sick children. Every man for himself was pretty much the idea at the time because no one knew how you know to protect themselves from this unknown and certainly not understood disease socially speaking we start having also the renunciation to the funeral rites at the beginning funerals obviously did occur but at the same time once you know the death death toll rose to um, a certain extent it was impossible to provide the Christian rituals for all of the dead. And that was pretty much of a social drama as well, not just a religious one. Funeral rites were actually, you know, the way to accompany the dead into the afterlife. So clearly renouncing to that was a sign of complete and total disruption of society. We also have an enormous economic impact that we need to um, we need to keep in mind. We have definitely a disruption of all sorts of trades. We have uh, um, a decline uh, initially, at least, of uh, a skyrocketing. Excuse me, of uh, wages, at least in the beginning. We have episodes of famine because uh, many people were unable to. Um, look after and cultivate the land. So all of that really created a situation where, you know, people really thought that the end of the world was near, was just what was going on at the time. In this image, I'm showing you uh, instead um, an image of uh, the building of Or San Michele, which is here in Florence at the time. It was the building, not only a church, but it was also a granary, and it was the building of the guilds, uh, so of the workers' unions. And this is a scene where, you know, this building that we associate with trade and with wealth and with art was turned into a place for the distribution of the reserve of wheat that the city of Florence had stocked aside for a time. So this speaks also of other attitudes. A city like Florence, that was one of the cities that had the highest number of casualties, very likely due to you know, the large number of uh, trading activities going on in Florence at the time also shows aspects of support, of uh, uh, use of resources of the city itself in order to try and kind of limit the terrible impact of the Black Death. Here comes the second part of the story. So uh, what followed, if any one of you is relatively familiar, you know, with the beginning, so with the early phases of the Renaissance age, the Renaissance already, for in some ways, was sort of beginning its development right after or during the moment where the pandemic or the Black Death was devastating, you know, Europe, but also the Eastern world and the Mediterranean. So there is, in a way, a sort of renaissance that starts occurring perhaps during or right after in the aftermath of the Black Death, which I think is the interesting aspect of it. Many of you probably know that the meaning of the word renaissance is rebirth. 
So there finally was rebirth after, you know, the tragedy, after, you know, the decline, after the darkness of the plague. And probably one of the best images to symbolize that rebirth is, uh, you know, the very famous image of the birth of Venus as painted by Botticelli, created later on, but, you know, becoming, <clears throat> excuse me, symbolically, this image of a rebirth of a changed world and, you know, somehow giving substance to the idea of the Renaissance as perhaps, you know, the age that opens up modernity in general. Historians have largely and still are largely debating whether the impact of the Black Death directly or indirectly created completely new conditions for the beginning of the Renaissance. I would say that there are somehow instances that would point in that direction. If we think of the um, mortality rate and the impact it had on, econo on the economy of the time, it led to a decline in labor force, but also to a skyrocketing in wages. There were, you know, the dismantling of the social structures of the past and an unprecedented social mobility forced by the necessity really to fill in all the gaps and the position left somehow open by the enormous number of casualties due to the Black Death. There was the impact on religion. Many people that initially had, you know, an extremely pious behavior over time in the long run turned their back onto the religious authorities. Because after all, you know, the church proved itself at the time not able to shelter the believers from the um, impending death. And on the other hand, the church was becoming, you know, more rich. Most people were still willing, you know, their properties upon dying to the church, um, which led in turn to, you know, an age of greater secularization, which is another one of the characteristics of the Renaissance. And finally, what initially was perhaps, you know, considered a selfish attitude would later on breed or develop into a more men-centered perspective, one that certainly made a great use of reason of critical thinking. In other words, that those were somehow the um, they were the bottom lines of a growing humanistic tradition. So with this, uh, you know, hope uh, and with this uh, idea, I uh, would like somehow us to try and connect, you know, somehow and relate uh, what the Black Death uh, is telling us. If, uh, um, you know, learning a little, you know, bit of a story of a history about it, what it tells us about what we are experiencing today. So um, my first suggestion is if you can think actually of any features that uh, um, we have somehow mentioned as uh, connecting to the Black Death and perhaps, you know, uh, any of them um, recurring in your mind when you think of the current uh, um, pandemic that we have experienced. I don't know if anyone would like to, you know, intervene. Maybe, maybe it rings a bell. Maybe there is some see, aspect that. I see Sara has her hand raised. Yeah, Sara. Thank you. Hi, uh, very interesting uh, your your lecture. Uh, I think uh, about the morning, about the. Uh, well, here in Mexico, I think in many countries, we used to accompany the mourners when someone is dead. But the pandemic affected that because we were not free to go uh, and be with the people. Um, well, in Mexico, I think in everyone, in, in, in all the world, uh, we have these uh, funerals online. Uh, so we can be with the family and express our mourning for the dead. Uh, and I think it's something that was very hard for most of us because um, when we are uh, in, in that situation, we want to be with, the, with our family or with uh, 
the person that we know is in pain for the loss of someone we love. So I think that is very related with, with that, not, not maybe equal or, or, or the same as was in, in, the, in, in the Black Dead yes, pandemic, sir. but I think it's very similar in the sense that something was uh, lost and impact and has an impact with us in, in a level psychological and emotional. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sarah, for, you know, this suggestion. And I totally agree. I think that we all have somewhere um, in our minds, you know, the images of, uh, um, unfortunately, you know, these funeral rites that if they happened at all, they would happen in, under a completely different circumstances. So certainly this is one of the images that uh, we definitely can connect with uh, thinking, you know, of, uh, of the Black Death. Um, if anyone wants to step in, obviously feel free. It is, in the meantime, I'll go on saying that there are obviously differences. There are differences and similarities as well. Differences must be accounted for. The nature of the disease is different. We were talking about, you know, a disease caused by bacteria. Then with COVID-19, we're talking about a virus. The infection itself was different too. At the time, the um, Black Death pandemic was actually um, affecting humans, but also other mammals. And that made it much harder you know, to trace, obviously. Uh, today, instead, uh, uh, we are experiencing something that is affecting mostly humans only. The mortality rates were enormously different. We have figures speaking of uh, your one third of the European population dying um, in uh, the course of one year in uh, 1348. So obviously we never fortunately reach those mortality rates. There's huge, vast differences in human culture, in institution, in the scientific knowledge that we fortunately have and so on. But there are also quite striking similarities. Both can be called pandemics in the sense, for example, that it's a contagious, um, it's created by a highly contagious organism, novel either in its own kind or as a mutation. It's also very uh, pandemic in the sense that it's geographically widespread. It's actually global in that sense. It's fast moving. And it was met by a minimal population immunity. In both cases, you know, the term pandemic applies in that sense. There might have been contributing factors then as now. It was an active global world of trading, of exchanging, of movements of goods and people. It was probably also a moment where we were met by then as now climatic and environmental changes that may have, you know, be one of uh, the reasons that uh, um, are to be uh, counted, you know, for this uh, pandemic. In both cases, we have a surprise effect. You know, people knew about what was going on then as now while it was already running its course, sometimes while it was already too late. In both cases, we have also a very interesting reaction of public hysteria, I would say, in the sense that um, at the time, uh, you know, certain particular groups were targeted Jews um, and they were accused of poisoning the water wells. Um, today, we are targeting different groups, but I'm not quite sure that that public hysteria is actually not uh, present, you know, at a similar rate today. In both cases, we've had, you know, very ambivalent reactions that would range from solidarity and support to self-preservation. Um, so all of those factors need to be considered. And I'm, uh, you know, quickly reaching somehow the closing part of this meeting, which I would like to do with, you know, sharing some possible um, suggestions for elements to think about and questions. And I will use some um, contemporary images uh, that I think are quite thought provoking. The question I would like to turn to you is uh, whether it is possible that studying the past history, in this case, the history of the Black Death, can teach us something about how we handle situations today.
In other words, or in a more general sense, can the past help us, give us really precious tools to understand the present? And in a way, can the present make more sense and at the same time be a contribution for us to help rethink what was experienced in the past? So can we have a more immersive understanding of the past by sharing similar experiences? And the, to the question, does human nature span the centuries unchanged? I think that we can you know, reflect on that by looking at the short selection of images that uh, I wanted to share with you. Here we have an image of a nurse that together with doctors were celebrated as today's you know, modern heroes in caring you know, for, in this case, a country that was sick, one of the earliest ones in Europe, and therefore this image of uh, a commitment of compassion as well. And the nurse there is represented with wings. Another image that is very dear to me, to us all in Florence, and when looking out of the windows is right in front of our faces here, it's actually Palazzo Strozzi, the, the museum Palazzo Strozzi, that in March this year has inaugurated this sort of exhibit in the moment where all museums were closed, where art itself seemed to be at a halt, and it inaugurated this um, installation called The Wound that speaks actually of the really effect, psychological, social, but also really the community effect of having no access to the places of culture. The next image that I have, you know, I think is also thought provoking. It's an image of Rome. This is uh, um, the Vatican. It's uh, St. Peter's uh, Basilica Square. And this is actually the Holy Week, April of last year. During the Holy Week, normally it's um, incredibly crowded, the piazza. Here we have a very lonely Pope that sits underneath uh, um, a sort of you know modern loggia with the square completely desert completely empty but finally there are also images that speak of the toll the psychological and human toll of having you know to maintain social distancing of having to uh, find new ways to connect to bond together to feel that we are still part of a community when we were required you know to keep our distance to keep the masks on and in some places we still are and my, uh, one of my last images, you know, that won the World Press Photo Award uh, of uh, this year, you know, April is by photographer Matt Nilsson, and it's one of the hugs of a nurse to an elderly woman that, uh, as you know, were not only the most targeted, but those kept in a longer stage of isolation. So I wish to just, you know, see whether you have uh, some suggestions as these images, you know, move on, whether, you know, there is any perhaps uh, um, contribution that can come from the knowledge of the past onto reading the present. And in particular, I would like to hear if you have any opinion on what awaits for us, in other words, could what we have experienced be really an opportunity for us to rediscuss uh, the very basic foundation of our society, even of our ethics? And in that, uh, I'm thinking of, I don't know, policies, for example, for um, policies for vaccines, uh, allocations, or we can think of uh, policies for personal freedom with comparison and contrast, maybe with the idea of a common good. Um, or perhaps, you know, the idea whether pandemics bring forth social unrest or perhaps simply social change by bringing to the surface, you know, the need for change that was already there. Do they bring forth the worst of human, you know, sort of nature, or do they bring out also the best? From your point of view, from your experience, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> 
I will give maybe another you know, minute if you want to perhaps reflect and you know feel free to interact whenever um, you feel the need to. Um, I think that this uh, in general, you know, has been a tragic, dramatic, traumatic experience, but one that we need to be able to use in a positive way. Perhaps, as I was suggesting, you know, to rethink it all over, to rethink what keeps us together as a society and as a community, to promote the best and set aside all of the behaviors that did not really sort of speak highly of who, you know, undeniably we are. To reevaluate ethical choices, maybe, um, to rethink the world entirely, maybe, you know, to look at issues from a completely new, novel, different perspective. And I think, you know, that to my last question, do you envision a renaissance, a rebirth as something that will follow? Maybe each and every one of you obviously will have their own suggestion and answer. But I think that if there is anything, you know, to keep and to, to survive while, you know, still um, experiencing this challenge, it has to be in the direction of looking for a sort of novel rebirth, novel renaissance. We have a comment on the chat, right? Um, so it, it says, I think of much needed changes in public health, gaining or regaining much more importance worldwide as a network for human beings. And then another one just came in too, and uh, it says, I think there might be the opportunity of a change towards recentering humanity in our institution. Hmm. Interesting, thank you. I, I think these are, are very good suggestions. You know, the healthcare systems probably, you know, need to be re-changed -cha and, you know, be more comprehensive and uh, we need to rethink the whole thing. And we need to recenter humanity. I don't know who wrote the comment on the chat, but, you know, my last hopeful thought is actually depicted in this uh, um, other work of art, uh, which is a street art from West Hollywood, which emphasizes the idea of uh, clinging to the one thing that we did see surface also in this pandemic, which is our humanity. It's about time to bring it, you know, to the center stage again. In the uh, image, you see how opening up, uh, you know, the opening up of this uh, coat under the mask of this uh, person standing shows the letters hope. And with this, uh, you know, thought of hope, I wish perhaps, you know, to close uh, this uh, presentation. And one more, one more comment uh, on, the, on the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I also think about long overlooked and overdue changes in diversity, equity and inclusion that have gained an imperative during um, and partially because of the pandemic. Absolutely. And uh, yes, that's another very precious suggestion. Um, inclusivity is important, and I do think that it's important that, for example, we have seen strong movement rising during the pandemic, um, Black Lives Matter movements and all of that somehow became part of the narrative that we experience, you know, in the very... Um, in the very direct past. So certainly we need actually to pay attention to what is vital behind these uh, suggestions of yours, uh, but also what you know are, I think, suggestions that perhaps the street art itself is able, you know, almost in instantaneously to translate. Look around the streets, look around the cities. Um, it's popping up in various forms, the hope that this um, sort of a street art fresco is actually, a painting is actually, you know, hoping for. So thank you for your comments. Unfortunately, I'm uh, actually not uh, seeing the chat, so Maria had to be so kind <laughs> to, um, to tell me um, all of these comments. I hope that this, you know, gives you simply some thought-provoking suggestions uh, for uh, what we are still experiencing. So thank you very much.